Hello everyone, today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode, we're going to talk about heterochrony, so let's jump right in. Remember from the Salamander's Tale that amphibian means both kinds of life. In many, but not all, amphibians, the animals spend a portion of their life in water and a portion out. Frogs, salamanders, and Sicilians begin life as aquatic larvae that undergo metamorphosis. The first two develop arms and legs, and all three internalize their initially external breathing apparatus, after which they move to terrestrial life. However, with the exception of Plethodon, whom we met previously, they must return to the water to breed. We mentioned in the aforementioned video that this process isn't some kind of recapitulation of the transition from fish to amphibians, so now we'll discuss the evolution of amphibian metamorphosis. To understand amphibian metamorphosis, though, we need to take a much broader look at metamorphosis in general. Metamorphosis is defined as, quote, a spectacular and usually abrupt post-embryonic transformation of a larva into a juvenile, close quote. Metamorphosis is common among animals, as various cnidarians, annelids, mollusks, arthropods, echinoderms, and chordates, among others, go through it. Among chordates, lancelets, tunicates, lampreys, some chondrichthians, most teleost fish, and of course amphibians, undergo metamorphosis, suggesting just how deeply such developmental strategies are grounded in our phylum, involving stem groups, and recurring in many modes in descendant lineages across millions of years. In all cases of metamorphosis, one thing remains the same. The larvae and adults either do not share the same environment, or the same resources, or both. For example, tadpoles are aquatic and often herbivorous, while the adults are terrestrial or aquatic carnivores. Many fish start life as part of the plankton, but become capable of swimming against the current as they develop. Metamorphosis often involves a radical transformation of the animal, however, this is not equivalent in all cases. Tunicates drastically change their body plan during metamorphosis, literally devouring their brain in the process of taking on a sessile adult stage, but salamanders change rather slightly by comparison. The change can involve not just morphological change, but also physiological, biochemical, and histological changes. Chordate metamorphosis is regulated by iodine-containing thyroid hormones like triiodothyronine, or T3, and thyroxine, or T4. While arthropod metamorphosis is regulated by ectosone. Researchers have been able to show that administering thyroid hormones to tadpoles before the normal onset of metamorphosis triggers the process to begin prematurely, and blocking the action of thyroid hormones results in giant tadpoles. Metamorphosis in amphibians follows a three-step pattern. Death and resorption of tissues used only by the tadpole, like the tail and external gills, respectively. De novo growth and differentiation of tissues necessary only for the adult, like the limbs. And finally, the remodeling of tissues for new functions. One example of this is the intestine in tadpoles. This is initially a long, coiled tube in the tadpole, but shortens by 75% and differentiates into the stomach and large intestine in the juvenile. Teleost fish are another well-known clade that undergo metamorphosis. In their case, metamorphosis is tightly linked with ecology. Eggs are laid in the water column, the larvae are planktonic, and metamorphosis occurs as the juvenile attains its adult ecological niche. We'll explore how flounders do this in a future tale, so stick around for that. This brings us to heterochrony. This is the process by which the development of some feature changes in timing. A trait develops earlier, or later, or prolongs, or shortens its development compared to its ancestors. One of the most commonly cited examples of heterochrony, and the one who gets the tail, 
is the axolotl, Ambistoma mexicanum, a fully aquatic salamander. The axolotl, which is critically endangered and native to one mountain lake system in Mexico, retains its gills into adulthood while other salamanders typically lose theirs during metamorphosis. The process by which a juvenile trait is retained into adulthood is called neoteny. Neoteny falls under pedamorphosis, which is defined as an organism undergoing a reduction in development relative to its ancestors. Like the model amphibian Xenopus lavis, the African clawed frog, axolotls have functional thyroid hormone receptors, meaning that their lack of metamorphosis does not result from missing receptors. Further, the axolotl's pituitary gland is fully capable of releasing thyroid hormones, but does not for some reason. And if someone were to put iodine in an axolotl's tank, the axolotl undergoes metamorphosis. I do not recommend doing this, as it is extremely harmful to the axolotl. This ability makes the axolotl a facultative pedomorph, even though they essentially never metamorphose in nature. Whereas other amphibians like the ulm do not metamorphose even when treated, making them obligate pedomorphs. A variety of genes are involved in metamorphosis, and some, like MET1, have been implicated as major regulators of the process. Even with the axolotl's giant genome sequenced, containing some 32 billion bases, 10 times more than our own genome, exactly which genes are involved in metamorphosis and neoteny have not yet been worked out. However, some very intriguing studies have been done in which axolotls have been crossed with other ambistomatid species. When axolotls are crossed with ambistomatids who obligately metamorphose, all of the progeny in the first generation metamorphose. But, if these offspring are back-crossed with an axolotl, then only half of the progeny obligately metamorphose, with the other half being pedomorphic. This strikingly suggests that pedomorphosis is a recessive character determined by a single major locus in this taxon. Amusingly, there was an early 20th century English zoologist named Walter Garstang who frequently wrote poems about organisms, and one such involved the axolotl. Quote, Ambistoma is a giant newt who rears in swampy waters, as other newts are wont to do a lot of fishy daughters. These axolotls, having gills, pursue a life aquatic, but when they should transform to newts are naughty and erratic. They change upon compulsion if the water grows too foul, for then they have to use their lungs and go ashore to prowl. But when a lake's attractive, nicely aired, and full of food, they cling to youth perpetual and rear a tadpole brood. And newts perinobranchiate have gone from bad to worse, they think aquatic life is bliss, terrestrial a curse. They do not even contemplate a change to suit the weather but live as tadpoles, breed as tadpoles, tadpoles all together. The family the axolotl is in, Ambistomatidae, are found from Mexico to southern Canada and are quite complex in their life histories. Some species undergo full metamorphosis, some are facultative pedomorphs, and others are obligate pedomorphs. Leaving the amphibians, we mention the example of the Sicilian dwarf elephant Paleoloxodon falconeri being a neotenic Paleoloxodon antiquus in The Handyman's Tale. Dogs are another good example. They look like juvenile grey wolves. Some dogs, like the Irish wolfhound, look much more similar to their ancestors when compared with extremely pedomorphic dogs like the King Charles Spaniel. The reason for such pedamorphosis is likely that earlier humans selected wolves for puppy-like behaviors, including fewer aggressive tendencies than adult wolves. However, a hypothetical scenario where humans actively went out to capture dangerous wolves or raided wolf dens to steal their puppies is unlikely. Why waste your time and your life? Did they understand the wolf's potential of being a lovable companion and a swift, four-footed hunting partner? Even if they did, would they have believed these hypothetical benefits outweighed the definitive risks and costs? Again, very unlikely. A more plausible scenario is that wolves were, in a way, domesticating themselves. 
As noted in The Farmer's Tale, pre-Neolithic hunter-gatherers were not simply relying on whatever they came across in their environment. They actively changed the ecosystem, altering the landscape with fire for their own immediate benefit, as well as expanding the habitat of flora and fauna that they could hunt and gather. This anthropological ecology would have also been attractive to wolves, who could prey upon the same animals as well as scavenging the scraps left behind by humans. However, the instinctual behavior of wolves is to stay far away from humans and their torches. Thus, wolves that were less anxious and aggressive are more likely to integrate into the anthropological ecology. They were also more likely to have been tolerated by humans. Over time, increased cordial interactions between humans and wolves could have established a mutually beneficial relationship. But would this select for neoteny in wolves? Well, selection for decreased aggression could have inadvertently made wolves more puppy-like as adults. We have seen this happen in the silver fox experiment. The researchers only selected for less aggressive behavior, nothing else. Yet, the foxes didn't just become less aggressive, their appearances changed as well. They got floppy ears, wagging tails, and even dog-like color patterns on their fur. They exhibited neoteny. Perhaps the changes in hormonal levels, such as the reduction of adrenaline that made them less aggressive, also had an effect on their development as well. Modern lungfish are also neotenic, not producing enough thyroid hormones to stimulate their metamorphosis. Fascinatingly, a middle Devonian fossil fish discovered in 1890 called Paleospondylus has been recently described as a highly pedomorphic tetrapodomorph putting it in the same clade as Eusthenopteron, Pandarichthys, and the tetrapods. Humans have also been proposed to have experienced heterochrony in our evolutionary history. Our modern skulls are superficially more similar to that of juvenile chimps than adults, and our hominin fossil record shows decreasing prognathism from Australopithecines to early Homo to our modern condition. Stephen Jay Gould returned to this theme often in his evolutionary writing, as when recalling how, quote, our brains grow more slowly and for a longer time than those of other primates, our bones ossify much later, and the period of our childhood is greatly extended. In fact, we never reach the levels of development attained by most primates, close quote. Meaning, in some respects, we are a neotenous ape. Part of the reason for our delayed growth is likely the restraints placed on birth. Babies must still have small heads while born, or else they become stuck. According to more recent studies, genes involved in neuronal development are also delayed in their activation. However, others have argued that some features considered to have delayed in development have instead extended their development, which is why it lasts longer. Yet others argue that a number of the morphological changes in human evolution were not necessarily heterochronic changes, but resulted instead from new evolutionary trajectories. The debate continues. Another type of shift in the timing of development is called paramorphosis, which involves elongation or elaboration of development. Think of it as the descendants becoming more adult than their ancestors. One interesting example of this process likely occurred in Ceratopsians, the frilled dinosaur clade that includes Triceratops. Early Ceratopsians have no frill but a bony shelf at the back of the skull, and as Ceratopsian evolution progressed, they elongated the bony shelf into a large frill. They also increased in size. This can be seen from Cetacosaurus with no frill, to Breviceratops with a small frill, to Protoceratops with the longest frill of the three. The juveniles of all three species look quite similar, but the physiological processes that led to frill elongation and larger sizes sped up. Or, to cite another amphibian, there is a frog native to Puerto Rico called the common coqui. This frog lays enormous eggs full of yolk, but tadpoles don't hatch from the eggs. Froglets do. Evidently, the common coqui undergoes metamorphosis from tadpole to frog, but this entire process occurs inside the egg. In other words, the development has shifted forward to pre-hatching, whereas most frogs metamorphose after hatching. So, that's the axolotl's tale. 
Phylogenetic analyses of the distribution of metamorphosis among chordates indicates that the phylum could ancestrally metamorphose, but the transitions among extant teleosts and amphibians are more recent additions. Thyroid hormones are clearly implicated in this process for at least all chordates. Some thyroid hormones are known to speed up metamorphosis in echinoderms, and even more startlingly, thyroid hormone receptor genes have been found in annelids and mollusks, possibly meaning that thyroid hormone-like proteins are involved in their metamorphosis from trochophore larvae too. So, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.